first time back training at the gym properly in about four weeks since I hurt my foot. It's my first day back, but unfortunately I'm not able to train legs at all until three weeks time. So for the next three weeks, it's gonna be upper body only. I mean, I could train legs, I could train one leg, but it would just end up looking like that scene when Quagmire walks out of his door and Family Guy and he's like discovered internet porn. That's probably what I'll end up looking like. One big leg against one small leg. Not a good look, I don't personally think. <laughs> Tell you what, I am gonna have a fun weekend building furniture this week. I've got a massive unit that I bought about a week ago, delivered today, which I need to build, and I've got this desk. <sighs> so, big thank you to the guys over at FlexiSpot for actually providing me with an electronic lifting desk. I have literally always wanted one of these. And in here is the unit which I still have to build. Gonna have a fun weekend um, building the studio, or getting the studio ready. But yeah, we're getting there. It's coming together very, very nicely. I wanna quickly talk about this new little feature that I have recently discovered in Photoshop, which I've been using and I've been quite enjoying using it across my Instagram pictures. Uh, so I thought I'd share it with you lot today. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna jump in the shower because I haven't showered since I've come back from the gym. Uh, I'm gonna meet you back here in approximately 10 minutes and we are gonna talk about this new little feature. In this tutorial, I'm gonna be showing you how you can add dynamic motion to your photos. This is something that I've been doing quite recently. I think it's been there and been around for a while, but I've only just sort of discovered it and started to play around with it. So that's why I'm making this video because I think it's a really cool tool that is embedded in Photoshop to give your photos a bit more motion, a bit more character, especially if you're applying this effect to a photo of your own, which involves a lot of movement. That is what I think. I'm trying to get at. The only tool that we're gonna be using in this video is gonna be the path blur filter. So that is the only thing that we're gonna be using in order to create some dynamic blur on our image. Now I will say this effect works better on images that serve a purpose. So what I mean by that is if you're applying this effect to an image of your own, make sure that the image serves a purpose of movement. So it might be a picture of a car that you've taken or an athlete, someone doing some sports. This is the first image that we are going to be working with the reason why i've chose this one to start off with is because it's quite an easy silhouette to select and kind of give you guys a little bit more of an understanding about what the path blur does so the first thing you're going to want to do is unlock the layer once you've done that, if you go over to the magic wand tool and you actually hold down on it, I would suggest, and this is something that I do a lot when selecting an area of an image because sometimes the magic wand tool sort of doesn't know which parts that you wanna select. So with this one or this particular selection tool, you can get really precise. So as you can see on the top left, you've got the three paint brushes, one that has a little minus sign above it and one that has a plus sign above it. So if you wanna select an area like we're doing now, you wanna hit uh, the little plus brush and then maybe turn down the size of the brush depending on the area that you are selecting. So for this one, I've gone to around 70. It's quite small because obviously the subject and the silhouette uh, is quite small compared to all of the image. Then what you're gonna wanna do is just really carefully sort of draw around roughly the area where the subject is. So as you can see, Photoshop has selected a few parts in this which I don't wanna select. So that's when I'm gonna go over to the brush with the minus over it and just sort of go in between his legs, uh, a bit at the top of the head and things like that, just to sort of deselect that area. So just really carefully sort of go over. That is the key for this, this part because you don't wanna miss anything out because it might look a bit weird. Then once you have everything selected, if you go over to the top and press select and mask, you can then view uh, anything that you've missed out maybe. Uh, it basically just removes the whole background to the part that you have selected. Once you're happy with everything, you wanna go and then hit Command J if you're on a Mac, and then if you're on a Windows or PC, it's Control 
J, I think. If not, I'll probably put some text on screen to show what the correct one is. And what that would do is that will just create a new layer of just the area that you have selected. So just the person or the silhouette in my case, that is gonna be its own separate layer. Once you have the person or the subject on their own layer, you wanna right click and convert to a smart object, which means you can apply the blur without any disruptions. You're going to want to go up to filter, blur gallery, and then path blur. This tool allows me to create motion blurs along a path. With this, you can control the shape and amount of blurring that Photoshop are gonna add to your subject. As you can see, Photoshop have given me this path blur by default. So the bottom end of the arrow is where the blur starts and then the top end of the arrow is where the blur ends. So the first thing I like to do is untick centered blur because obviously by default, it's basically blurring from the center of the subject that you have selected. So by unticking centered blur, it kind of gives off that motion from one side to another, depending on which direction your arrow is pointing. Example, on this image, I want the motion blur to be behind my subject. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stretch that arrow out and I'm just gonna bring it just behind the subject and point it a little bit diagonally if that makes sense for this particular image so as you can see if you move the arrow up or down it changes the direction of the blur so you just do that by holding the top end of the arrow and just moving it up and down into a direction that you want your blur to go in in the center you can see you have this point in the middle of the arrow which allows you to curve the path. If you want to add more curves into your blur, you can just click at any point on the arrow and it will add another point of contact so that you can curve the arrow in as many different directions as you want. Now, as you can see, we've got these three sliders on the right. You've got the path blur speed, you've got the taper, and you've got the endpoint speed. The effect that I'm going for for this particular image is just one single path blur, so I don't need to create multiple paths as the subject in this photo is standing still and his arm is up so if anything I just want to stick to one path and I want it to go straight down diagonally and I don't want there to be too much noticeable blur I want it to be quite discreet but I want to stretch it out what I want to do is I actually want to turn up the path blur speed so as you can see if I turn that up to around 300% it really stretches out that blur to give off that really long motion effect then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to turn up the taper and what that will do is that will reduce the thickness towards one end of my path so if I turn the taper up to about 22 20 percent as you can see it almost blurs the blur you know, so we're, we're doing a lot of blur in here. For technical terms, by using the taper slider, it adjusts the edge of the fading of the blur. So it fades the blur from one end to the other. Then the final thing to play around with is the endpoint speed. So if you turn down that endpoint speed, as you can see, it sort of brings back the blur. So it kind of decreases the stretch. Whereas if you turn the endpoint speed up, it will stretch out pretty large so if you want to sit around 187 so bang in the middle i think that's a good sort of place to be for this photo but again if you want to decrease that endpoint speed and sort of bring out a little bit less blur you just want to turn uh, the endpoint speed down that was quite a simple and easy photo for me to use or to demonstrate to you guys where i've just used one single path blur and given that sort of effect now i'm going to show you guys another photo which i've applied the same sort of effect to but I've actually used two separate path blurs kind of based around my image as you can see from this picture the model is portraying a lot more movement and a lot more motion in the way that he's standing compared to the last one so I applied the same thing to this picture than the last one I selected the model and all I did was instead of having one path blur I had two path blurs the first one following his right leg down and I've almost curved it so I've pretty much uh, followed the shape of his his right leg and I've done the same thing to my alarm going off um, and I've done the same thing to his right arm 
And then by doing that, I've actually created two separate paths because his hand is sticking out and obviously like the motion of his body is almost going in the opposite direction to his right hand. So I've applied two different path blurs. Again, like I said, once you actually apply your own blur to your own photo, if you play around with the speed and the taper and all that sort of stuff, you can visually see what looks good or what looks a bit too overboard and things like that. But that's why I applied it to this picture, which is a little bit more complicated. And and the last one, which was a lot easier. So I can show you guys two different images and how I've used this tool on both of those. It makes it look a lot more dynamic. It makes it interesting to look at. So that's why I sort of made this tutorial. And it's always good to try out new things within these programs, like in Photoshop, like in Lightroom. Just, just trying to do new things to you know, add some more interesting factors to your images is always good. It's always good practice. And it's good to sort of flex those Photoshop muscles you know, and pump some steroids. Don't do that. <laughs> Hopefully you got something out of this video. Hopefully it helped. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Subscribe down below and welcome if you are new. Follow me over on Instagram to be updated with all of my weekly photography and film antics, I guess. Uh, and I shall see you all very, very soon in the next one. Take care. Peace.